Hello, and welcome back to these lectures. And today we're going to cover uh, for conceptual physics, uh, chapter seven. And chapter seven is on energy. So let me get to that screen here so you can see that here. Now, if you remember from our last chapter, we talked about conservation in terms of momentum, that momentum is conserved. What was uh, momentum before must be momentum after. That is the case also in terms of energy, in that in a closed system, if there's no energy being added or no energy can leak out, the energy before must equal the energy after. It is conserved. And that's an important point in this particular lecture. Now, we can also talk about the different types of energy. So this is pretty much a dense chapter, uh, a lot of information here. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll be able to cover this, um, trying to cover this in detail, but the, don't get bogged down in equations or anything. There'll be a problem on the test from this chapter, but uh, it'll be a fairly straightforward problem. So let's get on with it. So energy, how do we measure energy? Well, energy has a unit. Remember we uh, had units for forces, newtons, for velocity as meters per second, so on, so forth. The unit for energy is joules. Or you could just put J, joules. Now energy, as I said, is conserved. What happens before, you know, if nothing's happening to it, the energy in a system before equals the energy after. And we could talk about efficiencies as well. So, you know, that's sort of what we're talking about in this particular uh, slideshow. Energy and matter make up the universe. We've also already and know this particular equation, right? E equals mc squared beautiful in its simplicity by Albert Einstein. That basically says that the energy in a system is equal to the mass times the velocity squared. The velocity, I should say, the speed of light velocity squared. So if we look at energy, we can convert energy, uh, matter to energy or vice versa, but we can't destroy energy, we can't create it. We can convert from between one of these things. And the entire energy in a system, energy and matter um, in the universe, if we consider the universe a closed system, uh, is constant. The energy we had at the Big Bang is the same energy we have now. Right? It's been converted into matter in many cases, but we can uh, look at the the entire energy is being constant. So it is a conserved quantity. So anything can be turned into heat, for instance, and that is something that we think of as energy, but heat is just a measurement in a sense of energy. And, and in a real sense, let me just write this down before we get much further, kinetic energy, is equal to one half times the mass times the velocity of an object squared. One half mv squared, kinetic energy. And in fact, if we say have a pot of water here and we add heat to it, the molecules, the energy we transfer in these molecules will start to move faster and faster and faster and faster. In a sense, the kinetic energy is a measurement of temperature. Temperature, I should say, is a way we measure the amount of kinetic energy. So that's one type of energy. You know, we'll just write that down up here. You know, kinetic energy, one half mv squared. 
but there's another type and that's work. Work is also measured in joules. And it is a force, same force that we've been working with, times the distance. So in order to do work, we have to move something. That's a little bit different than we've known really in, in everyday life, right? We can do work, but we don't always associate it with moving something. If I uh, have this pen on this table and I press down on it and keep pressing down on it, I'm not doing any work because nothing's moving, even though I'm applying a force. Work needs movement. So two things occur whenever work is done. You're applying a force and you're moving something. And that's sort of what that equation says. We're applying a force and we're moving something. So if I lift something up a distance, I have created work. How much work depends upon the force that I did. For instance, in this first example, I'm only moving one bag. In this second example, I'm moving two bags. I lifted uh, two bags up. Uh, they actually are <clears throat> trying to do a, a little bit of an example. I move one bag up just one story. I move two bags up two stories. Right? I would do twice as much work if I lifted one bag up or, and they're not really pointing this out in the video, but if I move two bags up four story, two stories, it's four times the amount of work as moving one bag up one story. So that's the amount of work that I do uh, when I lift something up and I can measure it in joules, as I said. We can use uh, Newton meters if you wish, but the, you know, as we look at this force, Newtons times meters is another way we look at joules. Okay. Well, power is different from work, is different from energy. Power is a measure of how much work we do, okay? Power is work for a particular change in time. What does that look like? Well, it's joules per second. That's the units of it. Joules per second is power. It's also known as a watt. And I'm sure you've heard that term, right? So if I have something that is 40 watts, it's 40 joules for every second. That's what power is. And you can see how the equation helps us on that. So if I lift up something that it takes me 50 joules to lift something up and I do it in 10 seconds, my rate and power is a rate is five watts 50 divided by 10. so i use more power running up the stairs than climbing them slowly because rate matters okay and so just try to keep in mind the difference between power and energy. 
Power is a rate of how we expend our energy, joules per second. Okay. So one joule per second is one watt. A kilowatt is obviously a thousand watts. And that's how we mostly measure the uh, energy in our house or whatever, how we use watts in terms of energy uh, consumed in the household is by a kilowatt. So we can also, as it mentions the kinetic energy and I've already mentioned kinetic energy here, but there's another type of energy. When I lift something up, I'm expending an energy in my body to lift something up, but I've increased its potential energy. Its potential energy. And the potential energy of something, or if we wanna say the potential energy due to gravity, is mass of something times gravity times the distance that I lift. I can use an H there if you like the height I lift something. So if I lift something that is 10 kilograms, right, up a distance of one meter, it's 10 times one times 9.8, it's 98 joules that I expended to lift that up. I had to, if we talk about conservation of energy, if I was purely efficient, I used 98 joules to lift that up. Now, obviously, I'm not, my body isn't 98%, isn't 100% efficient. We'll get into efficiency later. But I must have ex exerted at least that much and more because I was saying lifting my hand, of course. My body isn't totally efficient in how it lifted. We can go on and on. So water in a raised, in an elevated reservoir has a potential energy that if I just drill a hole at the bottom, the water's going to run out. If I raise up a pile driver up a certain height, it's going to have a certain amount of energy. There are certain uh, applications of that uh, that are fairly simple and uh, not very, um, how do you say it? Not, so, not very high tech, for instance. I could, if I am in pure daylight, I could raise using a lever, using motor, raise an object up to a certain height and then in darkness let it fall gently turning the motor again in a sense almost like a battery because I've stored that energy by raising it up a fairly large object and then letting it fall gently by turning a wheel and that energy used at nighttime because during the day I raised up that object and raising it up, I used energy during the day and I increased its potential energy, which can be used at another time. Again, remember, energy can't be created or destroyed. I had kinetic energy and energy from the sun that I raised up that object. So potential energy, as they say here, is mass times acceleration due to gravity times height, mgh. So if I lift an object up a certain amount of height, I know how much uh, energy it took to get there. And as you can see, the amount of work done to raise that up is the same whether I went a long route 
or a short route as far as gravity goes. So the energy of motion I mentioned is one half mv squared. But we also know that, and, and this gets a little bit more complicated, that's most kinetic energy. But if you think of this, if I expel energy in a sense uh, to lift something, let's say, I've done work to do that. Work is the change in kinetic energy. I lifted something up. And when I lifted that up, I went and had a velocity of zero. And then I, lifting it, I made another velocity and created a velocity in movement to move it up. I could also look at work as a change in potential energy. And I should use that as the example of lifting something up, right? I went from one height to another height. I changed the potential energy. And in changing that potential energy, I did work. Work is the change in potential energy. If I have a ball or something on a surface like this to make this move, I have to do some work. I have to push it. And the amount of force that I did, work is also equal to force for a particular distance, is the amount and the change in the kinetic energy. I pushed something. I applied a force. It started to roll. That gave it its velocity. And hence, it had a kinetic energy. Everything in movement, and everything is in constant movement, has a kinetic energy. Just by the nature. Everything, mass, in movement, velocity, has a measurable kinetic energy. Whether it's an atom, or a star, or a planet. So as they point out here, well, I can say that force makes for a change in kinetic energy, or I can start something moving. Fd is equal to one half mv squared. I applied work to something at rest. or I brought something to rest, and in doing so, I uh, created a kinetic energy. And that's sort of the, as I point out here, work is being the change in kinetic energy. Because it's a squared relationship, Right? Doubling the speed of an object means I need to do four times the amount of work, right? If I double V, the amount of work that I need to do to get this to happen will be quadrupled because it's squared. Okay? Reducing the speed of an object to bring it to a halt also takes work. Or I should say it's also translated that work done by the brakes is translated into friction for a given distance. So all that you know sounds like a lot of stuff is happening, and it is. A lot of stuff is happening all the time. Every, in fact, um, there's, a, there's another law, a Pauli exclusion principle, and also the uh, uh, law of um, uh, 
Well, basically, you cannot have one thing and know its exact position and its exact speed, which sort of implies that we can never have absolute zero in terms of temperature. Something is always going to be moving. So energy is constantly around us. Everything is constantly moving. We can transform it though into something else, move it around or did work to create that, whether I heated a pot of water as I showed there or whatever it is. But I can, and I can translate it into different types of energy. Like I did work to move an object. That's one type of energy work to move an object into a kinetic energy. But I can never create it. I can never destroy it. I made work to lift this item up. And it's up there. If I cut the wire, it's that potential energy that I created to make that, to put that up there, will be translated into kinetic energy. In a perfect world, there's no loss that's going to happen here. Now, obviously, there's no perfect machine and there's friction involved. So a bow and arrow is a good example. If I pull back on a bow and uh, uh, on the string of a, of a bow, we're, we're, I'm doing a work and creating a potential energy, that tautness that I feel. When I release it, the potential energy is translated and transferred into kinetic energy into the arrow. A little bit's lost by heat. So it's a good, uh, if I draw the, uh, the bow and I do, it takes 40 joules to do that. And I shoot an arrow. I should say 50 joules, and I shoot an arrow, and, it take, and the arrow has a kinetic energy of 40 joules, then 10 joules are lost to the system. 10 joules did not go into the arrow. It went to warming the bow. So we could say probably warming the arrow. So before we talked about, in the last class, we talked about momentum, right? Both have a pro are properties of moving things. We have kinetic energy is also a property of moving things. But one thing to keep straight here is that momentum is a vector quantity. And that if I move something in one direction and move in another direction, I can cancel out the momentum. Kinetic energy is a scalar. If I move 30, to use, use 30 joules in, to get to this place, and then I use another 30 joules to get back. It's not like I've used zero joules, I've used 60 joules. It's not canceled. Both are velocity dependent, right? The velocity, if I change the velocity, the momentum changes. If I change the velocity, the kinetic energy changes, but it changes by a square in kinetic energy. So what, you know, what causes movement? Typically we're talking about a machine of some sort, right? The machine, I am a machine to move things up, lift things, roll things, whatever, use a pulley, whatever. I cannot create energy, but I can transfer to one form or another, as I said before. But I cannot 
delete energy. I cannot, I cannot create energy. So whatever I put into the system, so it's a work in equal work out. That's the concept of conservation of energy. If we look at it, if I output a force in a distance, you know, I can use work here is equal to force times the distance. Well, right. if I do an input, if I moved something a distance, as an input in the negative, it would be in the positive as an output. It's a, uh, again, we haven't introduced uh, Newton's third law, but equal and opposite reactions. Forces come in pairs. So if I blast out at one end of a, a rocket uh, uh, engine, uh, an impulse out the back, it's going to move forward. Equal and opposite reaction. We see the conservation in this particular machine, a seesaw. And they try to uh, visualize this by looking at this and saying, okay, look at how this, this equality works. I have a bigger distance here that's a bigger D than here. I'm applying less force. Here, it's a smaller D and a larger F. Smaller forces, a leverage arm, means that if I'm moving a larger, over a larger distance, a smaller force, I can apply a larger force over a smaller distance. Okay. Pulleys are another example. Because it's like a lever arm, it changes the direction of the import in the, of the input force. It can allow a load to be lifted with half the force. I'm just pulling twice the distance. or more if it's a larger pulley. In a sense, it's multiplying the force because I'm using a larger amount of distance, pulling a larger amount of distance. Now we, we wanna try to recycle energy as much as we can. Uh, Edison used heat from his power plant to heat buildings. The typical plant wastes about 30% of its energy. And the body is a machine. We are not as efficient. The cells feed on hydrocarbons that release energy when they react with oxygen. Our metabolism isn't 100% efficient. We have waste products. So the sources of energy are all around us, but more importantly, the sun is our primary source of energy. may not be thought of as directly, right? We, uh, you know, you might say, well, I use heating oil, whatever. Well, whatever caused that heating oil, that fossil oil to happen was sunlight. It may have been millions and millions of years ago. And in a sense, you can look at it that if we had no sunlight tomorrow or if the sun stopped shining, the world would pretty much collapse without energy. Now, I should preface that what I mean by collapse is that slowly over time, um, everything from plant life and the whole cycles of nature would collapse upon themselves. So we can have solar energy, uh, we could try to capture it through solar cells, but, and 
we really don't have an energy crisis per se in that there's plenty of energy around us. As I said, everything that's moving and everything is moving has energy. The sun is applying more energy in one hour than we consume in an entire year. It's just a matter of converting it. One way we can store it is through something called a fuel cell that creates a potential energy. Now other fuel cells like the one they show here is one that uses hydrogen and oxygen. Another type of energy is nuclear power because stored, there's a tremendous energy stored in uranium and plutonium and we can convert that. We can also use biothermal or geothermal energy or we can use nuclear energy to store energy under the earth, in the earth. So you see this whole idea of fracking, as it were. We have a hole, we do hydraulic fracturing. We have a second hole in a water circulation, and that circulation in, in and of itself, because of the heat, powers a power plant. This is a geothermal power plant using hydraulic fracturing. So, there you have it. What do we need to know here? Well, we need to know about energy that it's conserved. We need to know that work can't happen unless you move something a distance. We also know that work can be related to a change in its move of a movement of an item. I have to move something to make work. Or I can change its potential energy by doing work. And this is known as the work kinetic energy theorem. That power is watts and it's joules per second. I should say that the unit is joules here, right? And that power being a rate is how many joules for every second that goes by. If I do 100 joules uh, of effort over four seconds, I have a how, higher wattage than if I did it over 10 seconds. Okay. So this is the fundamentals of what we're looking at here. Read the chapter as carefully as you can outline it and understand the whole idea of conservation of energy. Uh, watch the video uh, as often as you need to, of course, but uh, we're basically not going, I don't want to get bogged down to too, into too much into these equations so much, right? Just the idea of conservation of energy that I can change. I should also write that there is a potential energy. What is potential energy? mass times gravity times height and kinetic energy that I mentioned here is one half mv squared. So don't get too bogged down into uh, the equation so much, you know, and how they all relate to each other. Just know by the fact of the equation, for instance, I'm not going to have any work done if I don't apply a force or I don't have a distance, I don't move a distance. I'm not going to have any kinetic energy if it's not moving. 
and about what I said about the watch. So that's what we have for chapter seven. And that's about it. <laughs>